Ladies and gentlemen, please take a moment to get a coffee refill and grab some breakfast and you can make yourself your way into the room. We'll be starting the program in a few minutes. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. There we go. I'm Jim Kirk, uh, group publisher and executive editor of Crane's Chicago Business, and on behalf of ComEd and Crane's Content Studio, I welcome you to today's discussion on modernizing the power grid and how utilities are addressing the threats of extreme weather, particularly in northern Illinois. The effects of climate change are challenging our lives as increasingly more severe weather becomes the new norm, and utilities are modernizing their systems to withstand Mother Nature's onslaught and keep the power on now. But what is the forecast for the future? We've gathered a top-tier panel of experts to help that question. Actually, they're all rock stars. And if you would like to participate in today's discussion by asking our panel a question, here's how you can do that. <clears throat> Take out your smartphone, scan the QR code displayed on the screens to access our Q&A platform, tap the name of the event, and then ask the, ask, tap the Ask button to enter your questions. If you see a question from another audience member that you'd like to have addressed, just tap the arrow to the left of the question to upvote it. This information is also displayed on the screens around the room. Now for our opening remarks, I would like to introduce Alicia Tate Nadeau, who is the Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker's Homeland Security Advisor and Director of the Illinois Emergency Management Agency. Tate Nadeau brings more than three decades of experience in national security, emergency management, and public safety issues. Prior to this appointment, she served as Executive Director of the Chicago Office of Emergency Management and Communications, where she implemented and managed the third largest 911 center, uh, call center in the, na in the nation and procured all information and technology for public safety in the city of Chicago. Please welcome Alicia. All right, good morning everybody and welcome to Crane's Climate Adaptation. Uh, as said, my name is Alicia Tate Nadeau, and I'm the Governor's Homeland Security Advisor and the Director of Illinois Emergency Management in the Office of Homeland Security. I really want to take just a minute before we get started uh, to thank some very special people that we have here today. Uh, ComEd CEO Gil Quinones, WGN Chief Meteorologist Tom Skilling, Argonne National Laboratory Director Paul Kearns, and Crane Chicago Business Executive Editor Jim Kirk. Thanks to all of you that are here today to help advance the planning for climate change. It's great to be among so many like-minded individuals today as we continue to push the needle forward in the realm of preparedness for climate-related disasters. Today's discussion will challenge the naysayers to look closely at the impacts of human activities and the implicit bias of climate change and ecosystems. The increased prevalence of extreme weather in the Midwest and the impacts to urban environments like the city of Chicago and our critical infrastructure. With the new threats come new innovations and ways to explore and capitalize on new technologies like decarbonization and the movement away from fossil fuels and a search for new solutions like smart grids and a better understanding of weather phenomenon like convection. So why is all of this important? According to a study published in January of 2023 from Aon, Globally, we saw $313 billion in losses due to natural disasters. That same study found that $132 billion in total losses were covered by insurance, leaving a staggering $181 billion worth of uninsured losses. Now, these financial numbers might be disheartening to many, but they don't stand a moment's chance compared to the loss of lives. Globally, approximately 31,300 lives were lost in 2022. This global death toll is three times higher than it was in 2021. In Europe, 19,000 were heat-related deaths resulting from heat waves. And flooding in Uganda and Pakistan with associated droughts caused over 4,204 deaths. And in 2022, the U.S. had 18 big weather climate disasters, 
each with a loss over a billion dollars and over 474 fatalities. It is without question that Illinois is heading for extreme climate-related disasters, which will elevate risks for our entire state. And in 2023, the United States has already experienced 23 separate billion-dollar disasters. That's 23 different billion-dollar disasters, folks, and we still have three months to go in this year. All of these national statistics affect how we prioritize and respond for future looming disasters in Illinois. But I feel that we are poised to make this challenge. Thanks in part to the hard work and vision of our panelists and their teams that are on display for you here today. Managing these new threats means we must be bigger, faster, and more nimble in finding better ways to respond. To remain ready, we must increase our knowledge, skills, and abilities and conduct relevant research. Gathering, uh, gatherings like this one help foster more actionable efforts to lead to better preparedness. And as a leader, you are here to drive positive change for the industry and lead your community and the state. There is no doubt that together we have we can make Illinois stronger, more resilient state because you are the talent and the leaders of your respective communities and areas of discipline. This year, we look at the data from our partners at the National Weather Service. Illinois leads the nation in tornadoes with 133 tornadoes. That's right, Illinois leads the nation. That's absolutely unheard of in the past. You would have never thought, Oklahoma, yes, but Illinois, no. So how have these weather anomalies affected Illinois? I want to give you a couple of personal anecdotes related to uh, where we stand with climate change and the weather here in Illinois. Last month, we received a presidential disaster declaration for individual assistance for Cook County for severe weather and flash flooding, with nine FEMA state disaster recovery centers opened in Cook County. Here's your disaster update. Over $211 million in FEMA individual assistance has been distributed so far, and we have helped over 90,000 disaster survivors, and over 50 million in U.S. Small Business Administration disaster loans has been approved. This disaster itself makes it the second largest disaster in the last 10 years in Illinois. And a few weeks ago, we were given the green light for the White House on a presidential disaster declaration for public assistance to assist in strengthening infrastructure programs in 19 different counties here in Illinois. And in September, we again had more severe storms and flooding in Calumet City, Burnham, Dalton, and Chicago's Hedgewick neighborhood. We currently have five teams, which I'll be joining directly after this, that will be comprised of local, county, state, and federal officials going door to door to do preliminary damage assessments for the severe storm for September 16th and 17th. With all the talk about weather and the impact it has on our communities, I'm so glad to see these influential people with me on stage here today. These leaders are truly visible leaders who can help drive new initiatives. In hopes of solutions to help everyone improve our disaster response efforts for Illinois and the world. Again, I'd like to thank you all for having me here today. Uh, know that the governor and all of us at Illinois Emergency Management and the Office of Homeland Security appreciate all that you all do for us. And with that, let's get to the main event. Let's talk about our panelists here today. First of all, we have Tom Skilling here with us. Tom is WGN-TV's chief meteorologist, appearing weekdays on WGN's Evening News and WGN News at 9 and 10. 
He has established himself as a national respected meteorologist known for his in-depth reporting, enthusiasm, and the use of state-of-the-art technology. Tom recently celebrated 45 years. Let's give him a big round of applause for 45 years. Next, we have the CEO of ComEd, an Exelon company which powers the lives of more than 4 million residents and business customers, or 70% of Illinois' population. He is responsible for the safe and reliable delivery of electricity to customers for empowering them to manage their energy needs. We, he oversees the management of the electric grid for the city of Chicago and most of Northern Illinois in ComEd's partnership with diverse communities that he serves. He is also someone that I have on speed dial and talk to <laughs> quite frequently. Next, we have Paul Kearns, who serves as the director of the U.S. Department of Energy's Argonne's National Laboratory since 2017. Argonne is a growing multidisciplinary science and engineering research center in Lamont with $1.2 billion in diversified research portfolios and more than 3,300 employees, 8,000 facility users, and 800 visiting researchers. Kearns has set the laboratory's strategic vision to deliver pivotal discoveries in pioneering leadership and powerful scientific tools and facilities. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to our esteemed moderator, Jim Kirks, who is the executive editor and group publisher for Grains Chicago Business. And with that, I welcome our panelists to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, and thanks for everything you do to protect the residents of the state, and uh, obviously a big job that's getting bigger by the day. Um, thanks again, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, you know, as, as we get started, I think it's important to really kind of level set uh, and let our audience know what the com this conversation is and isn't about. Uh, this will not be a safe space for climate change deniers. Uh, the science is pretty much <laughs> settled on that. We are all living in a planet that is uh, demonstrating the real, uh, very real uh, effects of human activity on its climate. Uh, so up here on my stage uh, uh, today is, is are three men who can really attest to these realities because they deal with the empirical science and the real world effects on a daily basis. So welcome. Truly is a rock star panel. I, I, I meant that when I first said that. And just as an aside, I used to be a media reporter at a little paper called the Chicago Tribune. <laughs> and I covered Tom, uh, who was so gracious, would always take my call whenever I had a, a question about weather or his contract. <laughs> well, you, know. um, you were a great boss, too. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but anyway, you know, uh, when I first started covering, you know, you would, you would, as a media reporter, you'd see the ratings, the overnight ratings back, they, they were by paper back then. Huh. And at 9.30 at night, the WGN ratings would always show this spike. <laughs> and I, at first I was like, well, this is kind of weird, because WGN did pretty well, but, and, and then it clicks, it's Tom Skilling. <laughs> Everybody would turn, would come from another uh, station to, to hear what Tom had to say, so obviously just a, another testament to his, to his great. Um... Anyway, let's get into it. Tom, I want to start with you. Obviously, you know, climate change, we've heard so much uh, recently about it, so much uh, ink and broadcast uh, uh, chatter around it, but sure. this is not something new, right? I mean, this is no. something that has... Y you know, there's such it. mythology floating around about the science. Uh, the, the thing that really irks me is this notion that somehow scientists have changed their mind, that we, what happened to the ice age you were predicting years ago, and, and so forth. The fact is, a little bit of history on uh, where the notion that we as humans and the emissions we produce through fossil fuel use might affect the climate, they go back to the 1800s, pre-Civil War. 
The Industrial Revolution that's produced a lot of these emissions started arguably around 1760 or so. It's been ongoing. But for instance, the first notion that carbon dioxide could retain heat in our atmosphere dates back to well before the Civil War. Uh, American scientist Eunice Foote in 1856 published a scientific paper highlighting the extraordinary ability of carbon dioxide, one of the gases released through the burning of fossil fuels, to absorb heat. She inserted two thermometers in beakers, one filled with carbon dioxide and set them in the sun, and the one with the carbon dioxide ended up hotter. Then in 1861, that's the year the Civil War started in this country, uh, Irish scientist John Tyndall, uh, who by, uh, worked alongside Louis Pasteur, uh, who developed uh, pr disease preventative vaccinations, conducted several hundred further experiments and expressed surprise something so transparent to light as carbon dioxide could so strongly absorb heat. Tyndall made the connection that every variation in water vapor, another heat retaining gas, and carbon dioxide could produce change in climate. But sealing the scientific notion that CO2 production through fossil fuel use was likely to warm our planet was uh, done by the Swedish scientist and Nobel laureate uh, Svante Arrhenius, uh, who made the first estimate of how much carbon dioxide would increase Arctic region temperatures. This is back in 1896. He estimated that increasing carbon dioxide 2.5 to 3 times would warm the Arctic region of our planet 8 to 9 degrees Celsius. Well, what's interesting is since 1900, uh, carbon dioxide levels have increased uh, across the planet from 300 parts per million to 423 parts per million, levels that we haven't seen in four million years. Uh, that's a, uh, over a, about a 140% increase, and Arctic temps during that period have warmed by 3.8 degrees Celsius, suggesting his calculations in 1896 were actually right on target. Now, where this notion that scientists changed their minds on it uh, came from was uh, after World War II, industry uh, fired up again and started producing emissions in the 1940s. And the Northern Hemisphere went through a cooling period from the late 40s through the 70s. In fact, here in Chicago, our coolest and snowiest winters were the winters of the 1970s. And what's believed to have happened, and you can do core sediment, uh, ice core uh, uh, analyses in Greenland, and you see the, uh, uh, the particulates and all that precipitated out in that period. Uh, it was the fire up of industry after World War II that produced uh, turbidity or dirtiness in the atmosphere that reflected sunlight and contributed to a brief cooling in what has otherwise been a steadily warming environment. So a couple of news magazines put out articles about we're headed for an ice age and uh, they got some outliers, climate scientists, to say, oh, I think there's, a, you still hear that. Uh, people claim the solar cycle is gonna put us into an ice age. We've completely uh, outdistanced uh, the effect of any change in the output of the sun with the uh, heat retaining capability of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, the fact is, um, if you look at the scientific papers when these news and mar magazine articles were coming out saying we're headed for an ice age, 70% of the scientific papers in the 70s uh, talked about the warming that had first been identified as likely to occur post -industrial, during the Industrial Revolution back in the 1800s. So uh, this is trotted out by climate deniers to try and make it think, uh, sound like scientists are wavering on the notion. The fact is scientists are very clear and have been right along in the majority, the vast majority, that we're headed for warming and that's exactly what's going on. Right. So. Again, so congratulations on the 45 years. At the Thank beginning. you, Jim. <laughs> Nobody's more surprised he started approaching age 72 yeah. than me. Because uh, <laughs> before that, right. I figured I was going to get fired every day, you know? So. <laughs> uh, our weather was more interesting than I think Milwaukee, which was where you yeah, came, I think. Yeah, right. Um, but you've, you've seen a lot, obviously, over that 45 years. So keep, talk to us about what you're seeing now in yeah. terms of effects of the climate change as uh, it relates you know, to this region. When I knew I was going to do this, I decided, let's, let's go down and catalog some of the things that we're seeing. You know, climate change is insidious because it often occurs as extreme weather events. And those who deny its presence uh, don't see it out their back window, evidence of climate change every day. Uh, and they're saying, well, we've always had climate change and it hasn't affected. Climate change has had profound impacts. The whole Mayan culture disappeared in Mexico because of a 150 to 200 year drought. 
uh, the Salem witch trials, we burned women at the stake that, that were claimed to be uh, witches because we were in the Little Ice Age and crop production had gone down. How about the Dust Bowl years? That was a climate shift. Uh, that that uh, entire population that moved into our plain states had to move, and we may be on the precipice as uh, sea level rises of more migrations from our coastal areas as water inundates regions like Florida, coastal Florida. But here's what's going on in Chicago. I was running, a, we've just been through a summer where our skies have been clouded with smoke off record fires in Canada. 10 times the area has burned in Canada. They've never had a fire season like that than have burned in previous uh, fire seasons. We figure that the carbon dioxide released just from the fires, which by the way, whose smoke has been tracked around the planet, is probably three times the normal amount that's released in fires. And we've seen it here with beautiful sunrises and sunset, but with real air quality issues. We've watched Lake Michigan go through incredible gyrations. Now you can plot Lake Michigan levels and there's a sine wave quality to the curve uh, that tracks the ups and downs of the lake. But never have we seen such extreme ups and downs in so short a period of time. And apparently the periodicity of these shifts is decreasing. The change from 2012 to 2020, from record low to record high, is six feet. And the infrastructure challenges produced by lake level changes are amazing. Area tornadoes in recent decades have occurred earlier and later than any tornadoes on record in this area. Uh, we've had, as Alicia mentioned, 135 tornadoes, 93 is the total to date in the next closest state. Winters are warmer, summers have uh, been unchanged. Um, uh, allergy seasons are longer, so too are mosquito and insect seasons. Snowfall is down 25%. Imagine running a ski resort like Wilmot. Uh, nationally, the tab on cleaning up, as Alicia mentioned, is considerable. A 2000-2018 study in Illinois cataloged 1,500 floods. That's another product of climate change. Extremes in precipitation on both ends of the spectrum. An average of 1.5 per week with economic losses during the 2000-2018 period put at $3 billion. From 2004 to 2014 alone, the Chicago area received $1.8 billion in subsidized disaster aid due to urban flood damage. Rainfall across the state up 12 to 15%. That's a near 5% annual increase in 120 years. Uh, we're, we're experiencing what uh, Dr. Daniel Swain out at UCLA calls uh, whiplash precipitation uh, uh, events. Um, look at the flooding we had on July 2nd. Nine inches fell on Cicero, <coughs> eight inches in 12 hours in Chicago. Um, low income communities are being disproportionately hit by these uh, floods. Five of Chicago's top 10 years have occurred uh, since the mid-1800s mid have occurred in the last 22 years and sewage disposal is affected because we open up the gates and let raw sewage go out in the lake when rains overwhelmed the, overwhelmed the 20 billion gallon uh, uh, deep tunnel project. So it, it goes on and on, um, uh, the effects that we're seeing. And while they're not visible to us every single day, the climate change is real, it's ongoing. And uh, oh, let me, we're showing a couple of things here. Thanks, Gil. I'll just go through these real fast. Let me see what I'm, there we go. Here's a look at the extreme precipitation events across the country uh, since the turn of last century. You see the upward trend there. Uh, here is the July 2nd heavy rain event in the city that produced massive flooding. Uh, again, disproportionately affecting low income communities. There's the flood on the south side of Chicago on September 17th. Um, there's a look at one of the rain gauges, one of my viewers sent me a picture of, and there's some of the flooding that went on. There are some of the uh, shelf clouds with the thunderstorm complexes that came through. This is interesting. This is an analysis by Dr. Brian Brechtschneider, who's a National Weather Service climatologist. He looks at how over the 75 years from 1948 to 2022, precipitation occurrence has changed. Everywhere green is wetter, everywhere uh, yellow or orange is drier. And you can see the way precipitation has increased. A warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. Our hurricanes are getting wetter. Uh, they're slowing down. They're intensifying more rapidly. This is kind of interesting because, you know, we've heard about the heat in summer. 
And we really have escaped the worst of the heat here in the Midwest. You can see this is a look at how temperatures have changed. I was down at a wedding in Tampa over the weekend. They were talking about how hot it's been down there. Florida's had an incredible year, one of the hottest ever. In the West, we were hearing about Phoenix, uh, Los Angeles, California. Look at the heat out in those areas there and the way their summers have gotten hotter. The reason we apparently haven't is kind of interesting. We plant a new breed of corn plant and we can get four times the number of corn stalks on an acre of land that we used to back in the 1970s. These plants transpire moisture. And if you look at a plot of dew points at Midway Airport, they've been going up since 1970. Here's another thing that's interesting. Note the biggest temperature change uh, due to climate change has been in the winter, uh, not so much in the summer. So um, our winters have gotten markedly warmer. There are the fires in Canada. And this was the upper air pattern that was accurately predicted by our models going into spring. You looked at that, and that dome of warm air and the drought that accompanied it over Canada set the stage for the incredible fire season. Blocking patterns seem to be one of the biggest features of climate change. This is where air masses slow down and you get stuck in a weather pattern for an extended period of time. Uh, and blocking patterns, there are some of the fires that occurred. We also had fires in the west that set us our smoke. And here's a view of the smoke in Chicago. This was when air quality checks, sometimes the smoke mixed down to the surface. And there's a satellite view of the smoke that came in uh, off those fires uh, up north. There's a model forecast of the smoke uh, plume that was emanating from the fires. And this is kind of neat too. Trend in snowfall, everywhere yellow, orange, and red has had less snow in the 50 years uh, going from 73, 74 to 2022, 20, 23. So our snowfall is decreasing uh, because of the warmth. Here's ice cover on the Great Lakes, affects evaporation rates, how it's decreased with the warming. And ocean temperatures are at an all-time high. We have what are called uh, marine heat waves going on. The fastest warming body of water on the planet is the Gulf of Maine. The Gulf Stream has slowed down because of the meltwater coming off Greenland to its slowest level, we believe, in about 1,000 years. And the result is there's a damming effect. The sea level is rising faster on the East Coast, and the ocean temperatures are warming faster. By the way, you can see El Nino uh, off South America. That's that warm stretch along the equatorial Pacific, and that may affect our winter. And there's a look at the trend in ocean temperatures since 1900. And uh, there's the trend in uh, global air temperatures. So um, th just a couple of graphics that underscore what's going on the, the, that have been yielded uh, by the scientists. And this fellow, this is Dr. James Hansen. And I was telling Gil about him. Um, I had a chance to introduce him. He's the scientist, the NASA scientist, who sat before Congress in 1980 and really shined the light on the whole climate change issue much to the chagrin of the Bush administration who immediately went to his bosses at NASA and said, any papers he publishes, we want to go through the White House first so we can edit. Uh, and the New York Times got a hold of that and that, that never happened, uh, thank goodness. But I was talking to him, uh, he was out of Benedictine University and we spent a day together and I said, you know, I, what are your thoughts on Al Gore and other people? He said, ah, there are crazy people on both sides of the political <laughs> spectrum. But he said, um, he said, you know, he said, I get the conservationists mad at me because I'm all for nuclear power. He said, I, I think we're going to need nuclear power to generate carbon-free electricity as we continue our transition to, uh, uh, car to uh, renewables. And I mentioned that to Gil, we were together uh, during the Switch on Chicago uh, affair uh, back in May at uh, Buckingham Fountain. I said, you know, Gil, I, I looked into that and I found out that uh, a majority of our electricity in Illinois is generated by nuclear power. And I was asking Gil today, he says about 70%, Gil, yeah. right, is generated by, I don't think Illinoisans know that. I, I put up the fact I drive an electric car and people on social media and they write, well, where do you think the electricity for that comes from? It's from burning fossil fuel. Well and uh, well, I was pleased to read, no, it's not necessarily true. A lot of it comes from carbon-free nuclear power. Now, it has its own disposal issues. There's no way to generate electricity totally pollution-free. We, what we've got to do is try and generate it as clean as we possibly can. And Gill's people are doing that. And, 
Paul, what's going on at Argonne, we spent a day over there, the effort to decarbonize the transportation sector is stunning. Among the brightest scientists in our country, our national laboratories are such a gem. Uh, and uh, what they're getting us ready for the future, EV vehicles, uh, cleaner nuclear power, SAFs, sustainable aviation fuels to cut down on carbon pollution from uh, uh, aircraft. United Airlines locally here has put up $100 million uh, in the move to cleaner fuels to try and uh, reduce carbon emissions. And Argonne, they're partnering with Argonne. So I'll be quiet, Jim. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, but anyway, uh, thank you for the chance to share yeah. this with everybody. I, it burns me up when people say the scientists are flip-flopping on this. No, they're not. Our scientists have had this right since the 1800s. And it's happening. Well, now that Tom's slides have scared us this morning, uh, <laughs> we, we were talking earlier about how intense the, uh, the thunderstorms in the Chicago region have gotten over the past several years. And my three sump pumps in the last 15 years are a testament to that. But Gil, talk a uh, it's perfect segue into how this affects the infrastructure and, and especially the, the pressure it puts on uh, yeah. ComEd to address all this. Yeah. And, uh, well, let me, let me bring you back to 2020. I believe it was <laughs> August when we got hit by the derecho. Oh, uh, we lost about 850,000 customers. Wow. Uh, that's about a fourth of all of our customers. Uh, wow. you, you mentioned we have 4.3 million customers in Northern Illinois. And, um, and but for the investments that were made by ComEd over the past several years before 2020, we estimated that there would have been an additional 350 to maybe wow. 700,000 more wow. customers on top of that 850,000 customers. We would have lost half of all of our customers in Illinois. And that's the impact that, that, that's happening with more frequent yes. and, and more intense uh, severe weather events. Um, I'm gonna com oh, I can't yes. I can't compete with Tom on this slide, but I, I have a few that I'm gonna show you that uh, you know. And Alicia got her speed dialed to me things that we we had to deal with this year. Um, oh, I'm more. Oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. So these are the things. Ice storm is uh, are things that we have to deal with, as you can see. Uh, impacts are our poles and wires, uh, in tight spaces, uh, in backyards, uh, just the severe damage. In, on, on March 31st and April 1st of this year, in the western part of our region, there were 15 tornadoes that landed uh, in, that, in that area. And I believe, we, I asked my folks, even though there were not a lot of customers lost because the population is not dense in, 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 in that region, we lost, I believe, or we had to replace 400 to 600 poles. Wow. Just because of the damage of those, uh, of those uh, uh, from, from the tornadoes. Um, so, and you'll see not just small poles that are close to homes, but the big transmission towers that you see along highways were, were also impacted. So, this is happening more and more uh, to, to our grid, uh, not just you know, in, in, in small, but really in, in big, in big uh, magnitude of damage. Uh, you talk about Cicero. That was during the NASCAR event when, yeah. when NASCAR was, was, was here. We, that event flooded 17 of our substations wow. in the Chicago area and uh, Cicero being the epicenter, and, and we had to reroute power. Again, the, 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 the thing that ComEd has been doing is we're putting technology, uh, Alicia noted, used the term smart grid, that we're using technology where we could sectionalize the grid. So if there's a damage, we would automatically operate switches that would isolate the damage and then automatically restore the customers surrounding that damage uh, in terms of their power. We need to continue to be able to invest in those type of technologies, uh, backup power, 
in, in mission critical facilities, uh, work very closely with the state and the local government office of emergency management so we can swing resources while we're watching your forecasts, right? If we know it's on the western part of our region, we can, we can surge our resources, both the state and the utilities resources there a yes. day before, before the event occurs. Uh, the good news, ComEd is the number one in the nation in terms of reliability. We are the most reliable utility in the United States. And that's great because we are starting to attract businesses here because of that. We have carbon-free electricity, plentiful from our nuclear plants and from the renewables that are getting built here, uh, thanks to the, the governor and, and uh, the legislature for passing the Climate Equitable Jobs Act. More and more renewables are happening. Uh, we just, in fact, a, a couple of days ago, we just announced that we uh, hit our 50, 51,000 mark of solar installations wow. in, in our service territory. That, and that started about, you know, I think 800 something or so in 2016 to now 51,000. So it's increasing. Electric vehicle purchases are increasing in our service territory. But uh, the grid is going to be important in terms of uh, reliability uh, in, in the future as we electrify transportation, as we electrify space heating, the grid has to be reliable. Last year, Christmas Eve, it was minus 40 degrees here, <laughs> right? So the grid has to be there when, yes. when, when it's needed. Um, we're doing some work with Argonne and I let Paul talk about that, that they have a great capability of modeling the climate. Uh, Paul, you may want to just tell the, the, the process, but I'll tell you the headline. As we approach 2050, you'll be interested in, I, ha I don't think I've spoken to you about this, uh, Tom. The climate in northern Illinois will be more akin to central Missouri. Yeah. yeah. So it will be warmer and more humid uh, uh, as, we, as we go over the, over the years. But that's, the, yeah. you know, Jim, that, that's what we're dealing with right now. It's, the, the point that I need to make uh, and emphasize is this need to invest on the grid, need to strengthen it, need to put technology like smart grid. And so there should be alignment from uh, state government, our regulators, and us, the utility, to make sure that utilities in Illinois, like Comet, are financially strong and healthy so that it can attract private capital to be able to invest so that we can invest and harden the grid. And, and part of that, ComEd has, has been working with, with Argonne on ways to lessen the pressure on the grid or, or, or figure out ways to uh, manage the, the stress that the grid uh, Absolutely. is facing. So we, we, did, we did a study with Argonne and on what the climate will look like between now and 2050. Uh, because it will be warmer and more humid, there will be more trees that will be growing. So we have to cut more trees along, along our poles and lines. Uh, there will be more of the insects that eat our poles, <laughs> eat up our poles. Wow. So the replacement cycle of our poles will, will, be, will be more frequent. Uh, our transformers that are designed to cool off from the evening to the morning is not going to be able to cool off the way they've been cooling off uh, during today's climate, so we probably have to derate them going forward. And when we install new transformers, we have to put bigger ones because we know that they can't perform the way they perform today. So a lot of implications on how we invest and how we operate the grid. Paul, obviously Argon, a household name in a way that ComEd and, and Tom Skilling are. <laughs> Uh, Not Tom Skilling. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us, tell us a little bit about Argonne's work sure. in the climate, uh, climate change space. Okay. And I think you have slides. Slides as well. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here today. And what an honor it is to be on stage with both Tom and, and Gil. And, uh, very good to meet you, Jim. Jim. Paul. Nice to meet you. Really, yeah. uh, I will say uh, you've got a fantastic advocate and a real champion uh, for weather broadly and a really great spokesman on climate with Tom and Gil is a leader uh, amongst his peers in the utility community, so we're quite fortunate that he's now 
at ComEd, and he's been a real strong uh, partner with Argonne for quite some time in his previous position as well in, in understanding uh, climate change and the impacts it has on the grid and on utilities generally and, and helping really uh, customers understand and, and uh, prepare for the changes. So really a, a treat to be here. Um, I wanted to just take a step back. Tom was kind enough and mentioned nuclear power earlier in his discussion. I think many of you know Argonne's history. Perhaps uh, 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 the recent uh, Oppenheimer film refreshed your memory of Argonne's engagement and, and the effort or overall in terms of uh, uh, the Manhattan Project. But really, this is a photo of several prominent scientists. The shortest gentleman there is Enrico Fermi, somebody that we often associate with, uh, of course, not only the first uh, man-made or controlled uh, uh, chain release of nuclear energy, but also uh, the founding father, if you will, often considered the first laboratory director at Argonne National Laboratories. It's really fantastic to see him. Argonne was established in 1946. Our focus at that time was really putting uh, nuclear power to peaceful uses. Uh, today, we're quite different. Uh, we still continue to work on advanced nuclear reactors, uh, thinking about small modular reactors and micro reactors, and also closing the fuel cycle as we think about how to really drive towards a uh, carbon-free uh, power sector, it, really fantastic in that way. Uh, we do many other things, though, as well. Uh, we have some great uh, uh, researchers at the laboratory, which I know Tom's really passionate about a few of those that he's had the opportunity to bet. So, in Gil, so is Gil, and so please know our people are everything. We also are quite fortunate in that we have some fantastic facilities. U.S. taxpayers, uh, through the Department of Energy, has invested in their development at the National Laboratory, Argonne and the others. Um, for example, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, where we have petascale and exascale computing capabilities. We're in the process of commissioning Aurora, which will be the, the world's fastest computer, and, and really one of the tools that we use to help address, understand climate change, and help address the impacts as we move forward. Uh, we also have the Advanced Photon Source. They're one of the world's brightest X-ray sources, helping people really understand materials and how to really drive improvement. I mention that because that kind of allows me to talk a little bit about our clean energy work in addition. And one of the areas that Argonne's quite known for these days is really energy storage. I uh, think uh, lithium ion battery technology, uh, think uh, your cell phone, think your laptop, but also think about electrification and transportation. Uh, if you look at the electric vehicles that are on the road today, about 60% of them have Argonne technology in them. So it's really fantastic in terms of the impact the scientific team there at the laboratory has delivered. So it's a wonderful place. Uh, please visit when you have the opportunity. Um, in terms of uh, today's discussion on, on climate and climate resilience, one of the things that we've uh, established uh, based upon our uh, longstanding work really in two fields, one is climate science. Uh, over the last uh, 20 years, I would say, uh, also in terms of uh, decision analysis and decision making, helping uh, government leaders, community leaders, as well as industry make decisions uh, regarding critical infrastructure. We stood up what we call the Climate Resilience and Decision Science uh, Center at the laboratory, really bringing together our gold standard in terms of the client science we're able to do with the models we have, the commuting capability we have, along with the decision making capability. The desire here is to really put actionable information in the hands of uh, leaders, whether they be in the public sector or private sector, community level as well. Uh, key is understand and prepare for uh, the changing climate and really look for ways to mitigate its impact on everyday. Uh, citizens, really. Another great tool we've developed just recently, again, with a partnership with ComEd, I should say, uh, certainly the work we've done with Gil and his team have really helped us uh, do this, but uh, Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, a portal uh, this is done in, in combination, as I said, with uh, ComEd, but also AT&T and FEMA. It's a portal that anyone can access to really get the latest information in terms of our projections. Uh, based upon, again, the tools we have and uh, investment from other, other U.S. Department of Energy as well to allow communities and allow utilities to really understand how the climate is going to change. And so really fantastic. It was intended to really democratize access to this information so that communities can understand it and also have access and begin to plan themselves. So really fantastic here. And the last uh, slide I have here is really around uh, a comment, again, tying back to both uh, remarks by Tom and Gil uh, uh, in, in terms of impact of climate change and helping us understand and helping us work with uh, local communities to really help them 
uh, really kind of understand and also give them access to a set of scientific tools and uh, uh, measurements that allow them to really answer the questions they have about climate change. And so this is a fairly recent program, uh, just entering its second year community research on climate and urban science. Uh, it's about a $25 million investment made by the Department of Energy really on looking at what we call a the effect of climate change on urban communities, but also the effect of urban communities on climate, because it, there is a relationship here yes. that I'm sure Tom could speak to quite eloquently, but really uh, what occurs on the south side of Chicago is different than what occurs on the west side of Chicago, as an example, or what might occur here in the urban center as well. So uh, this is all about uh, working with uh, the community to help us really have the observational data so we can fine tune those models and, and provide better projections uh, for the larger community and the, uh, the decision makers in this field. So uh, observation uh, measurement centers, observation centers have been deployed recently at Northeastern Illinois University, also at Chicago State. Uh, we're working with the uh, uh, the Puerto Rican Agenda, Blacks and Green, and the Chatham Initiative really to kind of uh, uh, help uh, really uh, make sure that we're focused on the right questions and, and then give them uh, actionable information again so they can understand and plan uh, for what's going to occur in an appropriate way. ComEd is a great partner on this effort as well. So those are a few things. Curious on, on the micro, microclimate project uh, from a social equity standpoint, why is, why is that so important? Um, Tom made the comment earlier that in many cases it's really the uh, underserved or, or underrepresented communities or yes. perhaps those that are economically disadvantaged that often suffer the most uh, impact uh, from extreme weather events. And so that's really a, uh, why we're focused in this way really on the communities I, I mentioned and really essential uh, that we work with them because they uh, you know, not often have they feel like they've been invited to the table. Oftentimes, they're part of the, uh, they're uh, talked about, right, in the conversation. They're not really invited in to help us really define the scientific agenda and really help uh, understand at their level how best to address it. And so that's really why it's critically important. Uh, a lot of valuable resources in those communities in terms of people and their talent and, and their gifts. And so we want to make sure that, that we take good care of them as well as, as a national laboratory. A couple of questions from the audience. Uh, first, Gil, uh, we've seen virtual power plants used in California and Texas to stabilize the grid. Uh, how does ComEd plan to do that here, if there are plans to do that here? I think we're going to see more and more of that. Um, as I've mentioned before, solar is really growing here at, at a 50% compounded annual growth rate. I'm talking about rooftop solar. So over time, uh, batteries are going to be added to, to those installation. Community solar is also increasing. Community solars are, I like to call it shared solar, like a, a solar installation and then shared by uh, a community uh, to, for, for their subscription. Uh, so more and more virtual power plants basically mean that if we can orchestrate many batteries and, and solar rooftop panels as part of the way we operate the grid, when, when demand is high, we can deploy those assets to, to minimize the, the impact on the grid. And, and more and more of that will, will happen. And, and you're working with Argonne on a, on a decarbonization uh, study yeah. that actually predicts possibly, you know, as, as peak usage might change from summer to winter, and what, what kinds of changes would that mean yeah. for the grid? So we did a couple of studies with Argonne. One was to predict the, the climate uh, between now and 2050. The other study that we did with Argonne and another uh, consulting firm called E3, so the three of us, we modeled the Climate Equitable Jobs Act and the goals of Illinois as part of the U.S. Climate Alliance. Basically, if our state will be net zero by 2050, what does that mean? What's the decarbonization pathway to get there? And our estimates show that the peak electrical usage will increase two to three times. Wow because we need to electrify other sectors of the economy, transportation, buildings, industry, agriculture, et cetera. And the peak demand currently that occurs in either July or August 
when everybody's firing up their air conditioners, will now occur in the future in February, huh. probably between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning because of all the electricity needed for space heating. So it will be a complete change of how the grid will operate. It will be largely, uh, sectors will be largely electrified. But just imagine that two to three times. The grid will be two to three times bigger in terms wow. of peak demand. Hmm. Uh, and it has to be really, really reliable. Even though we're number one today, our level of reliability today is not adequate for a fully electrified future because it's a matter of public health and safety. Uh, we can't have prolonged outages when everybody's relying on electricity. Great. Tom, from your fans in the audience, more of a ask than a question, but uh, they want you to give that same presentation on WGN during your weather forecast. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, comment, that was great. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, also, another good question, you know, many, many and this is uh, uh, Gil and, and, and Paul, uh, good question to both of you. Many of the climate change deniers cite negative economic impact as a reason not to change. Can you please talk about the positive economic impact, including job growth, from modernizing the grid? Well, when we're seeing already, and I'll give you a couple of examples, because of our reliable grid and because of the uh, affordable and competitive electricity and carbon-free electricity in our region, we're starting to attract all the data centers here. Wow, interesting. Uh, many data centers want to locate uh, in the middle of our country, but also because of the reliability of our grid. And with the advent of more and more internet and now AI, those data centers are actually getting bigger and bigger. Uh, the governor announced a a gigafactory for battery in Mantino about a month ago, uh, 2,600 jobs. I think that was in Cranes first. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you guys announced it a little bit before, right? Uh, we said no comment. Uh, and so, you know, we have Rivian, you know, in, in uh, normal Illinois. Lion Electric near Joliet, the, the first electric bus and, and truck manufacturer in the United States. So we're starting to see the shift. And with the federal government's Inflation Reduction Act, the IIJ Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, and the Science and Chips Act, with the national labs here, Quantum is, yeah. is going to be one of the major industries in the future. Argonne and University of Chicago and others will be playing a huge role in that, so we're starting to see that shift and we have a lot of competitive advantages here. Great universities, a lot of water. I was going to say 20% of the world's fresh a water. A lot yeah. of fresh water. Yeah. Uh, and while more tornadoes and, and, and other severe weather events, uh, relatively speaking, uh, other regions have, have uh, uh, much worse than, than ours. Yeah. We've, we've reported a little bit on potential for climate refugees coming from other parts of the yeah, country here. Uh, yeah. We do need important. to strengthen the grid. We need to bring more transmission, uh, transmission within our, our, our region, but also bringing transmission from neighboring states uh, to, to strengthen the overall uh, performance of the electric system. Uh, Alicia pointed to, in her remarks, the uh, reliability uh, of, of, the, of the ComEd grid. Can you talk a little bit about what it takes to, what goes into that in order to, to yeah. keep that uh, reliable? Uh, two things. We need to be able to upgrade aging equipment. You know, the grid, it's a massive grid. We, we go from about 100 miles south of Chicago to the Wisconsin border, wow. Mississippi River to, to the lake. It's, it's about 11,450 square miles. Um, but we need to add new technology. So smart grid, uh, distributed energy resources like solar, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, all of those have to be done in synchronicity to really uh, strengthen the grid. What's important is that policy alignment between the state and our regulators to make sure that we have healthy electric utilities, financially healthy, financially strong 
electric utilities that can attract private capital for investment. And obviously you have a rate plan in front of the regulators at this point. Yeah, right now we, we have a, uh, a, our investment plan and a rate plan before the Illinois Commerce Commission and many of the things that we're talking about today uh, in terms of modernizing the grid, strengthening the grid, uh, is part of the plan that, that is currently under review. So Tom, just a, a question, you know, we've been discussing the ComEd Argonne partnership, uh, but let's talk a little bit about how these studies help the realm of meteorology and forecasting in general, especially here in the Midwest. Well, I, I, I'm dying to see the Aurora computer uh, go online. <laughs> I mean, the resolution of the climate forecast that will come on, the modeling is stunning and getting ever better. Uh, you know, it, it's taken a lot of hits from critics, uh, these models. The models actually have performed pretty well uh, in showing the ice melting in the Arctic and all the rest. I was impressed, uh, Paul, when we were out at uh, Argonne, you guys have developed a model of every neighborhood in the entire United States as you look to the installation of 500,000 recharging units. And as an electric car uh, owner, uh, I can tell you, you run into a problem where you get to some of these uh, charging stations, they don't work. And, and you're aware of that, your yeah. people are, and I thought that was really great. But this model, you're trying to equitably distribute these recharging units so that all neighborhoods, uh, won't, it, nobody's going to be excluded. Uh, and I, I think that's really stunning. Yeah. Um, really amazing stuff. But oh, the, the meteorological advances are, are just stunning. The modeling that's done. Uh, do you know the first two uses to which our mainframe computer was put in this country, and it was developed first at Princeton University, it was based on a paper in the 1930s from uh, Turing, Alan Turing, about the universal machine, and then Hungarian-American mathematician, a brilliant mathematician, uh, John uh, von Neumann, uh, oversaw the project to develop this, and when Oppenheimer got wind of it, he wanted ca calculations for the work going on at Los Alamos, but von Neumann used to think the, uh, the ultimate weapon uh, would be weather control. And so he figured, well, this computer will be idle at night. So he put together the first numerical modeling team back in the 1940s. And I think his thought process was, if we can model the atmosphere, then maybe we can learn to control it. Of course, we found out it's far more complex than that. Uh, and it, none of us will see weather control in our lifetime. We're inadvertently modifying it with our uh, pollution. But um, I, it, it, just think of that. That came from that. The computers that ran the first computer models, it would take two months to make a two-day forecast that was inaccurate. Today, we're doing them on machines that, as uh, Paul points out, uh, that, you know, they, they envisioned weather forecasting to become numerical back around the turn of the last century. And they thought there'd be stadiums full of accountants with slide rules and mathematicians doing calculations in teams and then passing the results on to another team. They couldn't have imagined the kind of computational power we have on these supercomputers today and the exponential growth in this. But I, it's interesting to hear Gil putting to work uh, the output of these computer models that yeah. are gone. Uh, you know, th this is a, an example of the practical, because we're going to have to cut our emissions, but we've got so much uh, greenhouse gas and if we stop producing emissions tomorrow we continue warming so adaption is going to have to be a big part of the program as, as Gil says you know yeah. the different transformers going beyond 2050 my uh, Don Wibbles who's a Nobel mm -hmm. Prize winning scientist out at the University of Illinois points out that our climate by the end of the century here in Chicago will be that of eastern Texas uh, that's how much we're going to warm up and uh, so, you know, this is going to have profound effects on agriculture and all, and we're going to have to adapt to that. We're going to have to be able to air condition and uh, meet the needs of our electric cars. And clearly, when you hear Gil talk and uh, Paul and the work that's going on, the effort is being directed in that direction. I think it's very positive. Yeah. You, you know, there, there's obviously been so much uh, study, and we, we, we read and hear about uh, hurricanes and yes. uh, wildfires, you know, things that are just dramatically, uh, e even from a, from a news media standpoint, they get a lot, of, a lot of attention. But relatively, you know, I was reading a story about even the lack of knowledge up in Canada about how many tornadoes are hitting there. 
and this phenomenon in the Midwest of convection. Yes. Not really being a part of a, a, a big study, but can you talk a little bit about why that's important? You know, it's interesting. Um, the modeling that's done uh, is unclear as to whether the numbers of tornadoes will increase. What is clear is that their intensity may increase, and the same is true of hurricanes. Never have the modelers said there are going to be more hurricanes. They've said the warming oceans and all will fuel faster intensifying hurricanes. You know, you figure today, and Gil, we were talking about this, how our utilities uh, get together and help one another. When a hurricane goes in, we have crews from Illinois that go down to Florida as in the case of Hurricane Ian, Florida's most expensive hurricane that went ashore last year. Yeah. Most terrible storm. Killed people, a lot of them died in, their, uh, uh, in the storm surge. What happens is these people on the barrier islands see a category one hurricane and they coming at them and they think, well, yeah, I think we can survive a category one hurricane, so they won't leave. Uh, and they wake up in the morning and the thing has explosively developed because of the warmer ocean and it's now a cat five. And uh, there's, you know, th that brings a storm surge in that completely inundates these barrier islands and you can't get to these people, they're gone. Um, so there's been a lot of work invested in trying to understand the interface between the atmosphere and the ocean, which is where a lot of this uh, energy that develops these storms and increases their intensity uh, takes place. But it takes three days to evacuate a coastline in this country. I mean, they'll reverse the highways so they're all going away from the coast and still people get into gridlock traffic and can't get out of there. So you've got to be able to offer three days advance notice, and I forget what the cost is on evacuating a, a mile of terrain. It's incredibly expensive, so the forecasts have got to be accurate. And uh, they've improved, and there's a lot of work going to make them even better. Uh, they now... They, you know, the planes that fly into these storms can only go so low. Uh, you can't get down to where the ocean is actually meeting the atmosphere, so they're sending sail drones in that skim along the surface, and the, uh, they drop these instrument payloads from the hurricane hunters, uh, which are relaying their findings. They'll crisscross a storm for 12 hours at a time, sending back uplinking data that then goes into our numerical models. But um, they're also dropping drones that can get down close to the ocean surface and do measurements down there uh, to understand better the interaction that's going on between the atmosphere and, uh, and uh, the ocean. Right. And, and Argonne's doing some work on, on the convection. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, one of the big challenges I was going to mention uh, really for uh, Argonne, the, the modeling we do is really based upon what we call Earth systems modeling, which is really kind of looking at you know, basically the Western Hemisphere and kind of understanding how climate is, uh, is, is really driven across the, that uh, great expanse. And the thing that we were able to do uh, really to help address uh, climate change more locally is really downscale that information to a uh, grid that's 12 kilometer on a side. And now the challenge is to go to four kilometers on a side, uh, which is attempting to get to neighborhood scale, again, really putting uh, citizens as well as uh, community leaders in a much better place and utilities as well uh, in terms of understanding what's going to happen and so that's critically important as well. It's really also about increasing uh, the use of uh, uh, today's technology in terms of sensors and really uh, uh, creating great observational data that we can use to really uh, fine tune those models is, is really kind of the discussion that's underway at the laboratory now. That's really important in, in, our, in our case because Argon can model the climate down to a 12 square kilometer, now going down to four square, square kilometer. Yeah. We can look at specific neighborhoods, especially uh, under-resourced neighborhoods that, that suffer the, the, the most uh, from the impacts of climate change. What, what then we can do as a utility is focus our investments, and that's what we're doing. We make sure that it's back faster during, af after yeah. severe weather events. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of the shift in how we look at investments uh, as, as the utility right. here. A, a good question from the audience. It's a little above my pay grade and my uh, degree in communications. Uh, I understand the grid in Chicago is networked rather than radio, and how does that impact uh, resilience and yeah. costs? So in the, the center of Chicago where we are, yes, it's network and mostly underground. Uh, the, the grid here. So it's, it's more reliable because there are several paths where electricity can flow to specific buildings and, and homes. 
whereas in the suburbs and in the rural areas, the radial, as I, you, you can see those poles and wires along, along the streets and, and highways, a little less reliable and subject to uh, weather, weather events. What we're doing is we're installing stronger poles and stronger cross arms, we're bundling conductors, so we're doing things to strengthen uh, the grid. We're layering fiber optic uh, communication infrastructure and, and private wireless networks so that we have system visibility real time and we can operate those switches to sectionalize our grid and to restore power, isolate the, where the damages are, be able to send line workers to, to, to fix those uh, damages as quickly as we can and bring customers back. So we need to do more of those going forward. Uh, and and that's, that's what uh, we're planning to do here. A couple of important questions for Tom. Will we have a snow season this year? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a strong El Nino developing in the equatorial Pacific and historically, though every El Nino has its own character, um, you have milder winters and less snow in El Nino winters. So that would be the early read on this. I, I would point out that La Nina's, which we had last year, typically send their rains into Northern California, and that one produced rain all through the Southwest, so it was very anomalous. Um, so there are a lot of, seasonal weather is the product of a lot of overlapping influences. El Nino just happens to be a very important one and um, you know I think its impacts reach to like 70 percent of the planet mm. it's funny because the whole weather system is interconnected and what goes on at some distant location has immediately upstream and downstream effects so that's why when we forecast Chicago's weather we have to have models that take into account the whole world because what's happening off Japan in terms of buckling the jet stream there has immediate impacts on what's going on here for instance so um, but yeah I think if you had to make a, an estimate on what might happen this winter, you'd say there's a tendency toward a leaning toward milder than average winter weather and less snow. Now we'll see if that works out. <laughs> you know, uh, the farmer's almanac says otherwise, but they say otherwise every year. You know, so I tell you, this, my news colleagues like to put farmer's almanac, for, and that bothers me because I think it's like trusting the groundhog, a member of the rat family. <laughs> the, the, I was just going to ask about the groundhog. Or the woolly, <laughs> yeah, the woolly worm, you know, yeah. That's great. <laughs> uh, another good question from the audience, Tom. Scientists have referenced a defense line of 1.5 degrees Celsius for global temperature increase post-industrial age. What are the impacts of that temperature line, and how close are we? Well, we're there. You know, we, we've already reached it. This will be the warmest year. We're superimposing El Nino over a warming climate. And by the way, what's different about what's going on now? People say, well, you've always had ice or, uh, climate change. Yeah, we have, but there are different reasons for climate change. Like the big ice ages, there have been five of them, are the product of changes in our orbit around the sun and are wobbling on Earth's axis. They're called Milankovitch cycles. It's astronomical in nature. What's happening now is happening 10 times faster than any climate change in the 300,000 years that humans have roamed the planet. Uh, there's never been an analog for this. And on a planet that now has seven and three quarters billion people, therefore is more vulnerable to changes uh, than ever before. So we're in a new paradigm right now. And uh, uh, that's, that's why adaption is going to be so important. And we know we're not gonna stop it. We're not going to reverse it, we can slow it. And that's what we hope to do. Just kind of one final question as we, we wrap up here. What are the um, social responsibilities uh, of businesses, whether they be giant utilities, media companies, small businesses, uh, to face the realities of climate change and to help mitigate? I don't know, Gil, if you want yeah. to tackle that. Well, this requires uh, a distributed solution. You know, everybody yeah. has to do their part to solve this, this crisis. In, in our case, uh, the grid is the enabler to be able to decarbonize other sectors of the economy. You know, without the grid, you can't decarbonize buildings. Without the grid, you can't decarbonize transportation yeah. and industry. So our role as the grid is to make sure that the grid is ready when electrification happens uh, to displace fossil fuel. Um, 
other businesses, private businesses, you know, they, they, they have their own goals uh, for sustainability and, and, and climate change, and I think that ought to be encouraged. Government, government sets policy. We're fortunate that we have uh, a law in our state here in Illinois, uh, led by Governor Pritzker and his partner in the, in the legislature that they passed in September of 2021. The Climate Equitable Jobs Act sets very specific targets on how we're going to get there. Uh, Illinois is a signatory to the U.S. Climate Alliance goals. About, there's about 18 or 20 states that, uh, so that sets the, the guidelines for, for both public and private sector to follow. Yep, I Excellent. comment on that as well. Uh, we use the tagline for Argonne, uh, we're about advancing uh, science and technology for U.S. prosperity and security. And when I think about economic prosperity, and it really needs to include everyone, and really a great emphasis. Uh, currently at the laboratory, uh, probably heightened in the last, uh, I'd say, three, four years around <clears throat> providing opportunity uh, for engagement, really, uh, of those that are underrepresented or underserved or uh, in the process, really, of uh, developing the science and technology and really understanding uh, from their perspective, it's a diverse perspective, much needed in terms of our thinking and where we're headed and, and how to really develop solutions that are meaningful for the, for the uh, planet. And so it's really critical in that way. So it's about providing opportunities, it's about engagement, providing those opportunities, it's about listening and really being attentive uh, so that we don't leave people behind. Right. Tom, Gil, Paul, we could talk all day. We could. <laughs> we all have jobs, but uh, thank you so much for- Thank you, Jim. For, uh, thank you, Jim. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks again to ComEd for, for underwriting today's event. And uh, if you enjoyed this program, please visit our events page at chicagobusiness.com. We have a lot coming in the next several weeks, including our exciting 40 Under 40 event on October 23rd, our Future of Food, November 8th, and most innovative companies on November 29th. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you for joining us thank today. You. I appreciate thank it. You. <laughs>